Tonight we discuss the governorship candidate we discuss with the governorship candidate of the African Democratic Congress Funsho Dohati. He is uh, going to be talking to us about his tiger agenda for Lagos. And Bashir Machina loses as Supreme Court affirms Lawan as Yobe APC senatorial candidate. This is Plus Politics and I'm Mary Anko. Funsha Doherty, Lagos State Governorship candidate of the African Democratic Congress, ADC, has promised to address the challenges in the Lagos State health sector if voted into power. According to him, his administration would prioritize education and health care systems and restore the trust that is lacking, particularly concerning public sector facilities. Tagging it as the tiger agenda, he has promised to focus on primary health care, critical care, and life-saving emergency systems. He's here with us in the studio this evening to talk more on it. Funsha Doherty, so good to have you join us in the studio. Thank you. And Happy much. New Year's in order because Same I haven't seen you since. Same to you. It's great to be back. <laughs> great. Um, so, of course, everybody's trying to understand what the Tiger Agenda is. So let's start from there. Okay. Um, why did you christen it the Tiger Agenda? Well, I mean, Tiger is an acronym. Uh, and it just turns out to be, um, I guess, a catchy acronym. Some have also said, are we calling it the Tiger Agenda because we are taking on the Lion of Bodylon? I, I don't know about that, but, uh, <laughs> but it's an acronym. So uh, Tiger stands for, the T stands for tax reforms for equity, prosperity, and growth. I stands for infrastructure for a modern megacity. G stands for government reform. E stands for education and health systems that the people trust, which you mentioned in your opening. And R stands for rule of law and public order. Mm. And we think with this five-pronged agenda, and there are a set of things under each of these themes, with this five-pronged agenda, the overarching vision um, is to deliver um, quality of life, dignity, and respect to mm. the average Lagosian on the one hand, and on the other, to lay a foundation for a Lagos in the first world. Mm. And we think uh, at the end of four years, and by the grace of God, eight years, we would have laid a foundation um, which, if pursued diligently, will get us to a Lagos in the first world. I mean, I like the Tiger Agenda. I'm going to allow you to you know, run us through it bit by bit. But, yes. but um, I'm very curious because every, almost every governorship candidate I've spoken with in the studio seems mm -hmm. to um, be talking about a certain person who they think runs Lagos. So I want to start with the question. Um, are you running against this man? Is it about him, or are you trying to save the soul of Lagos? I'm asking because I'm curious. Every single governorship candidate I've had, um, aside from the governor of this state, talks about a certain person that mm. has Lagos under you know, his... Yeah. So um, it's a good question, and I think that the question in itself, if you think about the question in itself, it should point a signal that there is an issue. Right? If every candidate is saying the same thing, there's a suggestion that, you know... But he's uh, not running for governorship. Hold on. There's a suggestion that there's, that, you know, there's no smoke without fire. Now, um, why is it coming up? The reason, I think, is that most people feel that um, the same agenda has been pursued for about 24 years in Lagos, uh, going back to the administration of Bolatinovo. And, that, and there's also a sense that those that have succeeded him uh, have essentially uh, not fully been principals in their own right, but have operated to some extent as agents and an extension of that administration. And, um, you know, this is not written anywhere, but um, it is a sense that people get. It's a pervasive sense. Uh, and some, even some of the actions of the governors uh, would tend to lead people in that direction. Um, so... You know, at the end of the day, I'm sure they will argue otherwise. But, you know, if it smells like a dog, sounds like a dog, walks like a dog, uh, chances are it's a dog. Let's start with the T for, for, from the Tiger Agenda. Um, how do you intend to um, actualize this? So um, the T again, tax reforms for equity, prosperity, and growth. There are a couple of things under this. 
First of all, we're saying that the tax system should be equitable. In other words, those that earn the most should pay the most, and those that earn the least should pay the least, and maybe sh should even get some relief, and maybe even support. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not always the case in Lagos of today. Um, from two perspectives. One is that those that uh, earn significant sums are sometimes able to evade paying taxes. But beyond that, many of the um, most vulnerable end up paying a very high rate of tax in, in effect because you know, there are taxes and levies that are collected from them on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you look at those levies and taxes, some formal, some informal, some official, some unofficial, um, if you look at them in relation to the incomes of those individuals, it's a very high rate, right? So they may end up paying a rate of tax in effect that is maybe twice or even three times what you know, higher income people are paying. And we need to deal with that because the people are really suffering. And so we're saying that that tax system must be equitable. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we think the tax system needs to support the growth of small businesses. So we need to reform the tax uh, administration and the tax code such that, and then provide incentives for folks who are establishing businesses and for businesses to thrive in the early stages so that they can create employment, which solves a problem for government. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would say here, and there are other measures, but I, I won't touch on them all, but I'll just touch on the final one here, which is in the administration of the tax system itself. We believe that there's a fundamental problem in the administration of taxes in Lagos State um, with the use of the Alpha Beta consulting arrangement. Mm. Uh, we think that that is not appropriate and we will seek to unwind it as part of our tax reform Yes, you agenda. did. I remember you granted an interview and you talked about unwinding it. Yeah, yeah. Um, why, do you, why do you want to unwind Alpha better? I mean, I'm guessing that it was brought for a certain reason. Is it not achieving the purpose? So, well, I mean, I don't know what purpose was uh, um, sort of adduced for its introduction in the first place. But if you look at the administration of the system today, um, really much of the work is done by the Lagos Inland Revenue Service. I have served as MDC of three different companies, all headquartered in Lagos. And I have received frequently letters from the tax administration, as all company CEOs have. I have never received a letter from Alphabeta. All the letters you receive are from Lagos Internal Revenue Service. When they're coming to do the assessments, it's Lagos Internal Revenue Service. When they're coming to do the audits, it's Lagos Internal Revenue Service. So a lot of the work is done by Lagos Internal Revenue Service. The role that Alfred Bitter is playing has more to do with record keeping, presumably, and maybe technology and those kinds of things. And there is no reason why we should have the kind of contract we have, which essentially seeds a portion of the state's revenue, your money and my money, to this company, which is owned by private individuals, a few. It's not, there's no transparency, no accountability around it. And it's huge sums of money. And so if it was the case at the outset that government needed a consultant to put in place a monitoring or record keeping system or a technology mm -hmm. system, that is something you employ a consultant to do. You pay them a fee for a fixed period and they move on and you operate your system. So the system that we have in place today Actually, there is no either moral or economic justification. So you're for saying you're going to probe Alpha better? Well, what I'm saying is that we're going to if, extricate. We will extricate the state from it in the first place. We will unwind it. Okay. Um, we will look at the arrangements around it. If there is reason to pursue further actions uh, through the criminal justice system or the judicial system, we will not hesitate to do it if it is called for. But that is not our primary. Uh, goal. Our primary goal is to unwind it and to create a situation where the state uh, is, is, is getting value for money and is not paying over resources that, is, that belongs to its people for no just reason. Let's talk about the business environment, which is very important because a lot of people run to Lagos. Um, even though Nigeria still has that problem of one city states and, and half the time those cities are not necessarily, you know, living up to expectations. So yeah. we keep seeing more and more people pouring into Lagos. Yeah. Um, what's the, what do you think can be done to um, enable the business environment further to be more friendly yeah. um, and, and attract more and more investments? So it's a good question and there are a few dimensions to it. One is that 
you know, businesses run in an environment and the environment is largely determined by infrastructure. To, to the extent that we can create an environment that has a good infrastructure base, businesses will benefit from it, whether that is uh, transit infrastructure, power infrastructure, water, all those things. But beyond that, the operations of government must be supportive of business and not by lip service, but in reality. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means that when somebody establishes a business, a new business person, employs one person, two people, that is not the time for government agencies a week later or two weeks later to show up on their doorstep and you know, be demanding all sorts of things. Government needs to be supportive of getting those businesses off the ground first. Let them employ people. That's what we need. We have a huge unemployment problem. We have a lot of youth. And that is what is going to drive the productivity of the overall economy. Uh, that's on the one hand. As part of that, there's a broader government reform agenda, which is the G in our Tiger agenda, mm -hmm. which says that a lot of the time, the reason why you see this predatory activity by government agencies is not so much about raising revenue for government or even stopping people from doing the wrong thing. It's really about using those uh, powers as a means to extort resources mm -hmm. from people. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so, and some of that is driven by the fact that the public service and the civil servants are not adequately compensated. How do you mean? So their salaries, in many cases, are not reasonable compensation when you compare them to what their contemporaries in the private sector earn. Right? So if people are not reasonably compensated, you do not really fully have the moral authority to insist um, that, well, I mean, actually you do, but it's not going to work, right? In the sense that, you know, you have to compensate people well mm. and then insist on integrity. I, 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 I want to differ okay. uh, on the issue of the civil service. Mm -hmm. I, I might not, a lot of people, this might not be popular opinion, mm -hmm. but then do you not think that the civil service is over bloated, hence the government being unable to remunerate them as it should be. Yeah. Again, we have a lot of duplication of offices, duplication of ministries, departments, agencies. They just keep you know, coming up. Um, and then, of course, the government is going belly up. So well, I don't, compensation I don't, for so, me is a bit of a mirage, isn't it? No, I don't think it's a mirage. And two wrongs don't make a right. Okay, so, I mean, you have good people in the system. You have you know, bad people in the system. So you cannot punish the good people for not taking the decisions that you should. You, if you end up with a bloated civil service, it's not the good people in the system, in the system that employed those people, right? And so in trying to fix a problem, you would address both sides. You address the compensation but, side. But do people have to leave? Ultimately, you may get to a situation where people need to leave. You may get there, sure. I mean, imagine if you were a private company, wouldn't you do the same thing to be able to reduce? You, you know, would, you would, but you know, there's a process you go through. And I don't believe, for example, that you should go in and say, until I fire so many people, I'm not going to raise salaries. No, I think that's the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. I think you need to go and start addressing the compensation, in introduce other things like meritocracy and you know, uh, accountability, monitoring performance, and so on and so forth. And the other part will follow. But you have to lead with good faith. Mm -hmm. You have to lead with good faith. And then you have a roadmap for getting to where you need to get to. Um, uh, and without that, I think you, you'll struggle. You know, and the other things which you need to have in place, you know, ensuring accountability, ensuring that people do what they're supposed to do, that they're not pursuing conflicts of interest, that they're not preying on your citizens. You will only be able to do that when you start this other process. And by the way, um, you know, when you look at the overall budget of Lagos and you look at the personnel cost element of the budget in relation to the overall total budget, uh, you see that this... Uh, roadmap approach that I'm suggesting is quite doable hmm. because the personal cost is probably less than 10% of the overall budget hmm. of Lagos State's annual budget. Let's talk about the E. Um, it talks about emergency services. I mean, 
if we de delve into the health sector, it's a massive problem. Yeah. We're seeing the brain drain, a lot of doctors and nurses and general health workers, you know, going away to other countries yeah. because of course they're, they're needed there and because they have better welfare and better yeah. insurance as, yeah. as compared to what we have in the country. Yeah. Now, I did speak to a doctor at Luce who yeah. talked about the fact that the emergency um, department is a total mess. You can barely get a cannula. Mm. Um, you know, to attend to a, a patient. Mm. Um, how how do you intend to deal with this? Because of course we lose. Of course, might be federal, but then we have state services and and like I always say, when I was a child, you could easily locate a health post, but now you, you can't find them. Yeah. So it's a good question, and ultimately, healthcare will be met by both the private and the public sectors. Absolutely. Ultimately. Uh, and it is today, and that will be the case um, always. But I think where we see gaps is in the quality of care that is delivered in the public sector facilities. And that has eroded trust over time. And so people will opt away from that system, and for good reason. Now, um, our approach is what we've called the, is the barbell approach. So on the one side of the barbell, we have primary care. Uh, a primary care focus. And on the other side, we have a critical care and emergency care focus. Now, on the primary care, we're saying that, look, where we see a lot of the mortality today, where a lot of the loss and pain is occurring today, is in the area of primary care. And where we're seeing the burden of mortality is around maternity, around newborn, uh, pre and antenatal, and early child uh, uh, mortality. Yeah. And a lot of that is around primary care. A lot of it is avoidable, mm -hmm. right? And what you need to do is to have a situation where you are delivering primary health care in government facilities that actually is delivering care and therefore people seek it. It's not so much about the, um, um, you know, the most state-of-the-art facilities where primary care is concerned, right? It's about basic care um, using technology to ensure that people are accessing the system, that you're keeping track of, of the babies that are born, they are being monitored and, and, and brought in for their vaccinations and so on and so forth. And ensuring that you deal with care in a preventive way. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you will not have problems that occur? No, obviously you will, but they will be much reduced mm -hmm. and they generally will come in at a time when you can do something about them. Mm -hmm. So to do that again, it's linked to our government reform agenda, which says that people have to reasonably compensate it. You have to create the right conditions, ensure that they have supplies, which is not about building huge buildings. It's supplies, right? It's, I mean, the cost of that is not, you can't, it's not commensurate with the cost of building facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and ensuring then that you monitor the quality and you have the supervision in place and the quality control systems to track customer experiences when they come in. It's the same way you would manage, for example, people who come in to, you know, to get service in any facility. And when you do that, um, you then deliver healthcare services, again, that people trust, which is our goal, and people will then proactively seek those services. Because, That's, because I know that um, you can't talk healthcare without talking about local governments. Yes. I'd ask you, um, Will your government be local government friendly? We know that there's been a running battle between state yeah. and local governments yeah. in terms of monies. Yeah. Um, how do you wade into this matter? Because most times, in most states, some of these local governments are at the mercies of state governments. So at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, philosophically, my approach is that you, know, um, you have to manage services close to the people. So in an ideal world, those services that are best delivered at local government level should be delivered there and the resources should be provided for them to deal with them. Mm. What I would add is that commensurate with that or at the same time you do that, you have to ensure that you're building capacity within the local governments mm -hmm. to manage those resources. Yeah. And so um, one of the issues that we've had in local government, state government relations has been that, the, as you know, local government elections are handled by the state. So a lot of the time, the, who ends up in power in the local government is a function of who is at the center. And those decisions are not always driven by capacity considerations, uh, competence considerations. 
it, it's often driven by things like loyalty, party loyalty, um, you know, loyalty to, to, to the state and, and ensuring that you have somebody there who's going to do your bidding. Mm -hmm. Now, in that scenario, um, you know, there's no alignment between that and deploying a lot of resources there because, you know, the capacity may not be there. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that, yes, you want to devolve to the local governments. You want to have strong local governments that can do the work and you support them from the state, devolve resources. But in doing that, you need to ensure that you're building capacity within the local government so that at the end of the day, the people are not suffering. Let's talk about the main, some of the major problems of Lagos. Um, of course, you know, traffic is top on that list. Um, but then most recently, we're dealing with um, fuel scarcity. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with not being able to get the Naira. Yeah. And so, um, of course, we, we can then now go down to talking about the Lagos traffic because, again, um, we can't talk about traffic without talking about how bad the roads in Lagos are and how yeah. they seem a bit abandoned. Um, yeah. Even though people make a case for some of them being federal roads, but let's look at the inroads in Lagos. How pliable are they? So I think that um, there are two sides to this issue. One is that the roads... Yes, the roads are not always in good condition, and many of them have potholes and things like that. And particularly where those potholes are at, like um, high traffic areas, intersections, etc., it's a compounded effect that those things have, which adds to the traffic that we see. Mm -hmm. And it's not trivial, the traffic that we have. We have one of the highest commute times in the world, which has implications for health and so on, and people don't think about the health part. Yeah, Governor El Rufai did say that all Lagosians need to go to heaven. <laughs> spend time yes, in hell having already. spent time in hell, although, mm. I mean, I don't know why he should be commenting on her. But anyway, um, so, so, so here's the thing. So, um, so you have that, but I, I think also that in addressing this, there are two things that we have to do. One, which is the long-term solution, is that we have to de-emphasize the roads, because right now it's only roads. So rail needs to be a mainstream option. And you know, we've been pursuing rail for 14 years. We've commissioned it, but it's not operational. So we don't, still don't have rail. Are you talking about the blue line? I'm talking the... about the blue line, yes. Um, so we need to have rail across the state. And then we need to have better use of our waterways. Because we have waterways, including the lagoon, which runs through the state. And we have not made good use of those. And we need to do more. So if we pick a few routes and we have robust vessels plying those routes, we can move a significant number of people through those routes. Mm -hmm. so let's pick a few key routes and do that. That will help. So that will de-emphasize the roads. But on the roads themselves, even with the existing road infrastructure, I think we can get a whole lot more out of our existing roads if we just created more order, less confusion, less chaos on those roads. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, it's, I use the analogy of an airport and to say that the way you get a large number of people through an airport on a daily basis is because it's very orderly, it is organized, structured, planned. There are lines, there's structured and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that, if people just showed up and were trying to make their way, you, would, you wouldn't get even a fraction of the number of people that you get through. And there's a similar analogy to, to the roads, right? So, um, so we need to do more in terms of ensuring that we have greater law and order on the roads, encroachment on roads, um, you know, people, um, um, you know, uh, driving against traffic, law enforcement agents who um, are not there necessarily to stop the bad behavior. They are there to extort people and allow them to then do what they want to do. Commercial drivers who act like a law unto themselves. And then the activities of the so-called agrarians who also compound the issues on the roads. Hmm. Um, so all of these things, I think, need to be dealt with so that you get the most value for the roads. Otherwise, you will keep building roads and you will not get the value of them, hmm. right? It almost will never be enough. Absolutely. Let's quickly, because we don't have time, talk about the elections, because I mean, like yeah. you said, 11 more days uh, to the governorship elections. No, no, not 11 days. It's on the 11th of March. On the 11th of March, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we have 19 more days uh, to the, to the elections. Yeah. Um, what are your major concerns for this election? Uh, are you worried about anything or are you certain that uh, it's going to be 
free, fair, and credible. And, and um, looking at all the situations, all the things that have been happening, again, I talk about the fact that people have no access to the Naira. And, and many would applaud the central bank that this is a way of also reducing the level of vote buying mm. and, and that we can suffer now and then be happy later. Mm. Um, how does all of this play out? Well, I mean, you, said, you say use the word certain. To be certain, I'm not sure we can, can be certain about anything. Um, I think that, um, so I was optimistic about this election, and I think I still am. Okay. Uh, I'm optimistic that we will see a better election than we've seen in prior election cycles. Uh, I think that you are more likely to see an election where the people's votes will count, where the will of the people will be reflected in the results that we will see. Um, so all of those, I think, are good things. Mm -hmm. um, I think INEC, have they done a perfect job? No. Have they tried? I would say yes. I believe that they are dealing with a tremendously challenging job, and I think that we have to give them credit for their resolve to do things the right way. Not everybody in INEC may be a good person, but I think on average, I think I would personally give them a, a, a pass mark. Now, the challenges that we are currently facing I think are multifaceted. You know, the question of uh, fuel, the question of the Naira change, and so on and so forth. You know, it's difficult to sort of assess the underlying motives, but whatever you might think the motives, whatever view you might take of the motives, I think the implementation certainly leaves a lot to be desired. Mm, how so? Um, well, I mean, I, I think that if you take, first of all, fuel, there's no reason why we should be facing fuel uh, the kind of fuel scarcity that we are. There's just no reason, right? Uh, if things are well managed, and of course it's a, it's a downstream symptom of, of poor management of the petroleum um, value chain, which is a long story. With respect to the Naira, I think that, uh, I think part of what's going on is an underestimation of what is required mm. to accomplish what is being set out to accomplish, right? Because, uh, yes, I understand the notion of redesign of the Naira to deal with illicit uh, stores of, 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 of previous Naira and so on. I understand that. But you have to think, who are the people standing in queues? It's not the guys who have billions stored away. Who are the guys who are bearing the brunt of this exercise? It's the market women. I was in Shomolu Market on Saturday, going around the market. And the mood in the market, you know, people are just beaten down, hmm. right? The women are saying that, look, you know, they're doing a fraction I of the business that they ought to do. And mm -hmm. it's not as if these guys are making a terrible amount of money, right? So, so there's that aspect of it. And I think that, that could have been better sort of thought about and planned. But I mean, okay. you know, ultimately, I think it's for the good, but we need to manage it better. Finally, because we have to go now in, in a few seconds. The, the president has said we should give him seven days. He's going to change, you know, all, he'll talk, there'll be a turnaround of sorts and he'll ease the sorrows of the average Nigerian. Um, how trusting are you of Mr. President and his promise? Uh, I don't actually know if I should respond to that because... Uh, <laughs> well, well, well I, I, so we need look, to know. Here's the thing. Um, I, I don't think there's any basis for that statement. I don't think there's any basis. I mean, on what basis is he making the statement that in seven days he's going to he's fix it? He's the president. Yeah, but... And he's heard your cries and all the moaning and going... Yeah, but he's in Nassau Rock. He's not implementing anything. So he cannot give us a promise of seven days because he doesn't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to say thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, this has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, Fusha Doherty is the governorship candidate of the ADC here in Lagos State. Well, I wish you all the best uh, in the coming elections and um, in all your campaigns. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, we'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be discussing the Supreme Court affirming Ahmed Lawan as senatorial candidate for Yobe North. Stay with us. <laughs>